so great. Didn't expect so many people from, from other places uh, uh, to, to join the call. This is just wonderful. Um, I think maybe let's get started here. And, uh, and I will kick off um, by just welcoming everyone. Thank you so much for being here, spending this evening with us. We hope this is interesting and exciting, as promised. Um, and hopefully this is the first of uh, many such events like this, learning opportunities in the future um, as well. I'm Lynn Davis, Program Co-Director for Healthy Democracy. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon, but working nationally and internationally. In fact, both my colleagues here tonight are in, not in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we design innovative public engagement programs and democratic systems and we believe that democratic lotteries can dramatically transform who participates in decision making and that public processes designed as collaborative and inclusive uh, from the ground up can comprehensively change how we think about making those decisions as well. How we understand our world, how we understand each other, and how we might navigate living in one society together. This event came around for two reasons. First, out of the great response we received from several conference presentations we gave this fall, uh, thanks to any of those of you who saw us there. And secondly, out of the charter review process currently happening here in Portland, uh, which is exploring a number of exciting democratic reforms. Portland has a really unique opportunity at this moment to be at the forefront of participatory decision-making through systemic reforms to its city charter including one proposal for an overarching civic participation commission that we believe will be released to the public soon. Uh, tonight, we're going to be exploring both the why and the how of democratic lotteries and deliberative processes, especially at the local government level, and later on in the, in the time here, uh, especially talking about processes that have, uh, are being made permanent. Uh, we have the help of several of our colleagues around the world uh, they'll help us understand why they believe everyday people selected by lottery can best tackle some of our toughest political issues, and also why guaranteeing representation through this method is so different and so vital. Uh, and they'll talk specifically about the ways that they're seeing local and regional governments make the lottery deliberation into a core feature of their democratic engagement. Uh, these are exciting, creative ideas for anybody interested in the long-term health of our democracies, we think, and we can't wait to hear more about them from our, our guests. Uh, these are cutting-edge reforms, uh, and uh, yeah, can't wait to hear about them this evening, so thanks so much to them for being here. We'll introduce them all in just a moment. Um, as you might expect from us, this evening will be democratically emceed by <laughs> two of my colleagues, first starting with Casey Bull, uh, our Outreach and Communications Director, Casey. All right, perfect. Thanks, Lynn. And just to echo, echo Lynn's sentiment there, we thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna let each of our presenters introduce themselves. We have three uh, international leaders in the field of lottery deliberation here with us. When they introduce themselves, we're gonna ask them to share their name, uh, the organization that they are affiliated with, and answer one fun question. We hope it's fun. <laughs> You can either answer uh, what is currently inspiring you most about the field of lottery deliberation or one reason you're excited to be here with us uh, today. So, uh, Felipe, we're going to start with you. Again, if you share your name, your organization, and your answer to our, our fun question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Casey. And, and, and thank you, Alex. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, all the Healthy Democracy team for for the invitation i'm very happy to to be here to share these uh, thoughts with with you well i will present uh, myself my name is uh, felipe rey um, i am an assistant professor at uh, pontificia universidad javeriana in, in bogota in colombia uh, and i am also co-founder of, of ideemos uh, ideemos uh, i must uh, say does not have an exact translation into into English, at least in one word. It would mean something like, uh, let's think together. So in Ideemos, we try to think together uh, on how to, to adapt and to strengthen deliberative democracy and lotteries in, in Colombia and in, in, in South America. 
Well, and, and the fun question, what, what inspires me most uh, in the field of lottery, of lottery um, deliberation, I, I would say perhaps creativity, the need for, for change. I, I think that, that I believe that we need to think about new kinds of political institutions. And I see lotteries as a very promising avenue for institutional change in the in the in the future, you know, democracy is very challenged um, uh, today. Challenges that come from populism, fake news, manipulation, polarization, um, a democracy that cannot handle issues like climate change, for example. So we have to ask what kind of democracy we need um, for this particular uh, moment, and we need to ask uh, if if traditional institutions are uh, uh, enough, you know? I think if we could design our governments from scratch, we would do it this way, I, I don't think so. Uh, so these are the institutions that we inherited perhaps, but not necessarily the ones that uh, uh, we need for, for, for this moment. So creativity is for me, the, the, um, the most important part of, of, of this uh, work. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing, Felipe. All right, Nicole, we'll turn to you next. Thanks, Casey. I'm Nicole Hunter. I work for an organisation called Mosaic Lab. We're based in Australia and work all over the place doing things. Um, and I, I wish I had a great definition for Mosaic Lab like Felipe has, but I guess the reason we chose that name was because the mosaic of our community coming together and the lab bit is our, our commitment to learning. Um, and I'm going to answer both your questions. I'll do it quick, I promise, Casey. I, I think the thing that inspires me the most about the field of uh, lottery deliberation is seeing people's faith in democracy changed. And I, we see it every day where people go, oh, my gosh, I believe that this, I can have an influence, I can contribute and make a difference and people are listening to me. So to see people's faith in democracy restored is the biggest thing that drives what I do and what inspires me. And why I'm so excited to be here today is because these are really cool people <laughs> and I love hanging out with them and we do occasionally get to chat and it's just fun to share ideas together. Excellent. You did keep it quick. Thanks, Nicole. All right. And David, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Sure. I'm David Schechter. I'm the coordinator of the Democracy R&D Network. We're in international network of organizations and individuals working on deliberative democracy. Um, about 50 organizations and 50 individual members, 32 countries, six continents. What inspires me? I'm inspired by all the different places where lottery deliberation is becoming a permanent part of democracy. It's happening in East Belgium. It's happening in Paris. It's happening in Victoria, which Nicole will tell you about. It's happening in Bogota, which Felipe can tell you about. It's happening in Scotland, which I'll talk about a little bit because I'm involved. It's happening in Oregon um, with healthy democracy. Okay. Wonderful. Well, as everyone can see, we really have an all-star team tonight, and we're going to get to hear a lot more from everyone soon. Uh, but next, we're going to ask Lynn, I think, to share your screen, and Alex and I are going to give a quick presentation uh, on, a, on a bit of the foundations of the work. Wonderful. Thanks, Lynn. And hello again, everybody. Um, just to piggyback on a little bit of orientation for where we'll, we'll take the next hour and a half or so. Um, as Casey said, we'll be presenting just on the basics of what this approach is, what are democratic lotteries, what do they offer uh, community participation, and then we'll have basically the last hour to have rich conversation and questions um, with our wonderful guest speakers here. And in the last, last little bit, we'll be able to take some of your questions, audience questions. So just to set the stage. Um, but here we are. My name is Alex Ranieri. Oh, <laughs> can you 
Can we go back to the first one? Great. Um, my name is Alex Ranieri. I'm program co-director along with Lynn Davis. Um, and very happy to be here tonight talking about how we guarantee representation um, by imagining, uh, reimagining community participation with this wonderful tool that we love, uh, democratic lotteries. So at Healthy Democracy, we believe in elevating the voices of everyday people, bringing new faces to public decision-making and designing a more collaborative democracy together. So this is the framework in which we do all of our work. So first let's talk a little bit about what our current democratic systems look like and who participates in them. Sorry, I have a lag on my end. Okay. Um, so in this first slide, we're, uh, let's look at who participates uh, in our democratic systems in our home state of Oregon, Healthy Democracy's home state, um, and specifically by looking at who holds public office. So um, this graph has a couple layers, so let's just focus on, uh, on the height of these bars. The, the green and blue represent a disparity in gender, um, but let's focus on the racial disparities that we're seeing here. So in this graph, we see that uh, white folks hold public office at a rate that's highly disproportionate to their population, while folks of color, nearly a quarter of the population in Oregon, hold only about 5% of elected offices. Yeah, thanks for being my pointer, Lynn. Um, and this is a huge disparity, a huge problem. Um, our elected political bodies still fall dramatically short of truly representing our diversity. Um, and as Lynn has moved to, so this about elected officials is not new information for most of us. What we're really interested in at Healthy Democracy is moving down the scale of democratic governance systems. This tracks all the way down from state offices to local office to which communities participate more in less formal structures um, at the community scale. So here we're looking at rates of participation among various income brackets. Um, so the bars representing the percentage of adults who took part in at least one civic or political activity over the last 12 months. And while this exact study is aging a little bit, um, the trend is super consistent with what we see in our processes um, or, or the public engagement uh, field at large. Really, the more money you have, the more economically privileged you are, the likelier you are to participate in our political system. So moving again, back again to racial disparities, um, these data depict the percentage of adults in each of these three racial groups who took part in at least one civic or political activity, again, in the last 12 months. And we see huge, hugely disproportionate between um, white, and, white participants and folks of color. And this is uh, an interesting kind of new, um, new study that was done um, that depicts that we often don't even know who's participating. So this chart depicts research from a recent report on the state of public engagement among immigrants who are serving on boards and commissions and committees um, across the state of Oregon. And the authors found that really a surprising number of public bodies don't even collect demographic data for their participants. So only about 30% of boards and commissions at the city and county level even track who is participating. Um, this oversights, uh, oversight depicts a big flaw in the system. I think we aren't paying enough attention to who is involved in public decision making at the many scales. And at Healthy Democracy and in this field, we argue that this problem calls for a dramatic shift in uh, business as usual. Let's take a moment. I would love to hear from everybody before we keep talking at you. Um, just answer in the chat. 
Um, who's most involved in public decision making where you live? Do you see these same trends playing out? Um, are there different trends you want to highlight from your area? Just let's take 30 seconds or so and, and give us some, uh, some participation in the chat. There's nothing we love more than participation. <laughs> Bryson says business lobbies, sure. Big money, young male or single individuals with lots of time. Yep, absolutely. Amari, mostly white folks with high socioeconomic status. Yeah. Older white people, elected civil servants, lobbyists, activists. Mm -hmm. Agree agreement there. Fantastic. So I think we all see really similar trends in our areas. And this is an international group too. So it spans, it spans across the globe in many ways. Um, oh, one more here in Portland, older financially stable white people who know the system as well. Yeah. So a blend of kind of demographic characteristics and folks who are familiar with these systems often go hand in hand, housing interests. All right, thank you for, thank you for contributing there. We'll move on. <laughs> so it brings, back, it brings us back to one fundamental problem that we as a whole in our many diversities don't see ourselves reflected in our democracy. So this is uh, a little bit uh, leading into our philosophy and our, um, our methodology of lottery deliberation, uh, the democracy pie. So most of our public engagement in most of our democratic systems is either open to anyone, anyone can self-select in, public comment, come testify at a city council meeting, et cetera, or special invitation. Um, so outreach to stakeholder groups uh, or targeted, yeah, targeted outreach of any kind. But we think there's one fundamentally missing component of this democracy pie, which is lottery selected processes. <laughs> um, you can go to the next slide. But we realize that as folks who who want win-win solutions for, for our problems, we're not gonna just divide up one pie. We should really make more pies. And truly each of these approaches to getting folks in the room, deliberating about our most important public questions and policy issues um, are valid and necessary. So here we go, all three uh, democracy pies, no need to split it up. <laughs> so we have again, open processes that are open to anyone. Um, they're great because they're inclusive, at least in theory. So anybody can self-select in. However, we often hear from the same individuals over and over again. And um, it's really thin participation and can lend itself more towards debate rather than deliberation. Special invitation, fantastic for engaging with stakeholders, out outreach targeted to marginalized communities, um, it can be really specialized, targeted, um, but again, often similar individuals and takes kind of a top-down approach, engaging with leaders often rather than more grassroots communities. Lottery selection is this brand new addition to the democracy pie table, and we guarantee new folks in the room, diverse faces, and um, engage in really in-depth deliberation. Um, however, participants are limited and it does take time. All right. So that moves us into, as Alex started there, our kind of new approach to democracy. And what we offer to that new approach is lottery selected deliberation. Okay, so a quick overview of what lottery selected panels and deliberation looks like. Before the process even begins, we work with a partner, which is often city staff, to define a policy question. Um, these lottery selected bodies are especially well suited to deal with those kind of complex or sticky controversial topics. 
those wicked situations, if you will, that are hard to solve via the other methods we traditionally have. So what that means when we start the process, we go through the invitation phase where we invite between five to 10,000 uh, randomly selected people across a community to participate in one of our processes. We ask them a few demographic questions, which brings us to our demographic lottery. We select uh, a, a proportionally representative panel, and then that brings us to inside the room. So once people are in the room, panelists interview experts and stakeholders, ensuring information is strong, reliable, and reflects the many perspectives on the issue. Then panelists go through multi-day, professionally moderated, moderated, iterative, small and large group discussions to weigh options and prioritize alternatives. And finally, at the end of the process, panelists produce a set of policy recommendations, including rationales and dissenting opinions for the public and for decision makers. So both who is in the room and what happens in the room are equally important. But next, we're going to dig into who is in the room, how they got there, and why it's so important. All right, so first we're gonna break down some of these kind of these, these big terms for who is in the room and how they get there. So we start with an invitation mailer. As I said, we send out between five and 10,000 uh, mailers to random addresses across the city. We collect a pool of potential panelists. Uh, and many of these are people who have never participated in any kind of community engagement previously. Um, per the demographic factors that we're looking at, we can look at things, and, and most practitioners do, look at things like age, race or ethnicity, income level, educational attainment, gender, uh, house, house owner or rental status, and experience of a disability. So again, our processes look at between seven and nine demographic factors, um, as, as do most conveners. That really ensures that we have new and diverse voices that have space uh, in these processes. And that leads us to our selection event. So this is a fun and festive night that leads to the random selection of a proportionally representative panel. Conveners are able to create kind of a microcosm of the community in one room. As you'll see on our next slide, yeah. This time it's all in one virtual room, but we get to see all of those different diversities represented in one panel. Next. So what does this look like in practice? Uh, here you're seeing some specific statistics from our one of our last panels uh, that we completed in Eugene. The first set of pie charts uh, at the top is the race and ethnicity factor. Uh, in this, though we, though we guarantee equality, we can work towards equity in our selection lenses. So here in this pie chart on the left, you see um, the statistics of the general population. And in the middle, you see who has responded. Even though it's a little small, we can see that it's an overwhelmingly white population who has responded. In this particular process, we decided to use the K through 12 demographics uh, so that we had a more diverse range uh, represented on the panel. And that's what you see here on the right. Similarly, here in education attainment, the graph on the left, you see the general population, the graph in the middle, you see who responded. So um, disproportionately a higher educated level who responded. And finally, on the right, you see who we selected. So more representative, more propor proportional to the general population. Okay, so that leads us to our next crucial component of our processes, which is a dedication to accessibility and inclusion. We show, our our, we show this dedication in a, in a myriad of ways. We know that large sections of our communities are kept out of participating through these kind of invisible barriers. Things like time, uh, availability, costs, lack of familiarity or comfort with public meetings, and a lack of information. So this approach, lottery selected deliberation, really helps to eliminate as many of these barriers as possible. Um, so first of all, lottery selected deliberation covers the costs of participating. All panelists are, are paid an hourly wage, which is competitive for that region. They're reimbursed for any kind of travel costs or things like child or elder care that they might incur. And they're provided with equipment if they need any, things like laptops or hotspots. Second, support staff provides uh, direct support to panelists, helping ensure that they feel personally welcome and comfortable with all elements of the process. 
This also can include tech support if it's necessary. Third, we use professional moderators and the techniques that they use to help balance participation to create a safe and welcoming environment that empowers people um, and makes space for all types of learners. And lastly, uh, we, we don't assume that people coming to the table have any prior policy expertise. While we encourage folks to draw on their lived experience, we also equip them with all the tools need, they need to complete the task at hand. And some people ask uh, in, in learning about democratic lotteries, isn't this just equality, not equity? Which is a super valid question. Um, equality is a minimum guarantee, but only, only that, only a minimum. So as we've covered already, um, we, through democratic lotteries, can guarantee representation on seven or more demogra demographic factors all at the same time, which is amazing, but it also doesn't have to stop there. Um, so there are many ways that we can incorporate more equity-driven designs as well. And these are just, just a few. Um, and folks in our field are doing, doing really exciting things in this area. Um, first, in the selection process. So with this model, it's really easy to tweak those demographic targets to over-select for marginalized groups or groups who are particularly impacted by a policy issue. Uh, second, through informational inputs. So Casey mentioned this long, extensive information gathering phase. Uh, targeted stakeholder outreach can be used as a special input to that process. Third, through in-process support and design. So for example, identity-based caucusing can help groups that have historically been excluded or don't feel as familiar with those policy conversations, public meetings, um, have intentional space to deliberate with folks who share their identities. Okay. And folks who are, <laughs> folks who are new to this model also often ask, what about stakeholders, right? Why would we select people who have no prior interest or experience with a policy topic when there are community leaders who are trusted and have been endorsed by communities to advocate on behalf, on behalf of particularly impacted folks. Um, also a very valid question. And how we see this approach is that it's entirely complementary to our existing model. So on the left side, we see how public participation usually happens. Members of the public organize into advocacy organizations, community-based groups, which then lobby policymakers on their behalf or train community members in how to do that self-advocating and, and lobbying. With lottery deliberation, we're not changing that puzzle. We're just adding a new layer of new voices into that system. So advocates not only continue their important work, but they also have a fresh audience, a lottery selected body uh, that hears stakeholders' views, and dedicates hours upon hours of their time to in-depth deliberation and consideration of that wide array of perspectives. So we think this is an asset to, to everybody, really. There are benefits to policymakers and that it helps surface fresh perspectives, new ideas, um, and also enhances mutual trust and governance systems that's quite lacking right now. For stakeholders and advocates, it allows for this unique collaboration with an entirely new group of, of voices in the policy process who are really dedicated to understanding the range of views on an issue. And then for the public, fosters more ownership over public decisions, and it presents a model that we're, we're lacking in a lot of areas of our governance for what collaboration looks like and what evidence-driven discourse looks like. And lastly, of course, it increases access for historically marginalized groups. All right. So now we've, we've talked a bit about what the process looks like, but we're going to back up a little and talk about the principles that guide that process. Uh, so as shown, uh, we really value inclusivity. We use proactive recruitment techniques, as well as a multitude of accessibility different process design elements to ensure that new voices are not only present in the room, 
uh, but they have the tools to express the value in their lived experience. Next. Uh, one another guiding principle is representation. So as Alex has discussed in length, um, we want to we can guarantee representation across the community's many diversities. And in each process, we select a minimum of seven different different demographic markers. Okay. All right, so the next principle that guides us is integrity. Um, all of our processes are research, have a research-based design. They are very transparent. Certain aspects are completely open to the public. And we offer independent evaluation, both by academics and third-party practitioners. Another guiding principle is collaboration. So in our, in our um, deeply deliberative processes, uh, each is a highly structured iterative process between small and large groups. We have highly skilled professional moderators, and that provides a respectful evidence-driven exchange. And our last principle, or one of the last principles that guide us here is empowerment. So each panel really has authority over their process and a real ability to influence policy on whatever given policy issue they're discussing. Wonderful. So now we're going to talk a little bit about where this is being used, what it looks like internationally, um, but just a brief, brief teaser here because we'll mostly leave that to our amazing international colleagues uh, when we get to the more conversational part of this. Um, but here you'll see a map that came out, I believe, it, just a couple years ago of all of the lottery deliberative processes uh, to date that have happened around the world. This is taking off in a big way in Europe, in Australia. Um, as you'll hear about momentarily. And there have also been several examples in our corner of the world in North America. And just to present a few terms here, this is called different things uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, if you've heard of citizens assemblies, citizens juries, uh, that's very common terms to describe these processes. Um, that's what we're talking about when we say lottery deliberation, um, and we're just moving slightly away from the word citizen to not, not have that potential of, of the exclusion, because um, all of our processes include residents, not contingent in any way on legal citizenship status. So just a brief word on words there. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about a couple of Healthy Democracies programs uh, before we hear from our, our panel of speakers. A couple of years ago, we completed the Milwaukee Citizens Jury. So a little, little town of, of 20,000 uh, wanted to know, how should city councilors be compensated? This question was posed to a panel of 20 residents, ages 16 and up. It was really fun to have, have high school aged uh, panelists in the room. And these were the demographic factors that they used um, to reflect the city's demographic profile, uh, location, age, race, gender, political party, educational attainment, and renter or homeowner. And the impact, they wrote a recommendation to city council on pay uh, that was adopted, adopted by council pretty immediately. Uh, our last project, as we've mentioned a couple times, was the Eugene Review Panel in Eugene, Oregon, uh, which dealt with the implementation of some statewide housing code changes that were mandated. Uh, we had 29 panelists who looked at this topic and used very similar demographic factors, um, uh, but a couple things to note here was that we included experience of disability for this one, which was new. Um, and just highlights how, how the demographic factors, depending on the topic area, can, can be all uh, changed and part of the design based on, uh, based on what makes sense for that project. Uh, in terms of results, they created four different reports on housing principles, the future of housing in Eugene, and um, some draft code language that they worked with the city to, to produce. Okay, so to wrap us up here, we love ending uh, with a quote from a panelist. 
Um, Jose, who is a panelist in Eugene, said, you engaged us in the actual work of democracy and that has left an imprint. I feel like this is community, which is just wonderful and uh, speaks to the spirit and the feel in the room of what these processes are to those of us who, who really care about them. All right, thank you so much. Here's our contact information and we'll spend the rest of our time tonight getting to dig into the, the details with, um, with some of our, our speakers here. And I believe I'll pass it over to Casey for our first question. Excellent, thanks so much, Alex. All right, so our first round of questions, our goal is to kind of set the international stage and emphasize the value of representation across that international stage. So David, first question is coming to you. As someone who is deeply familiar with the international landscape of lottery deliberation, can you speak about the breadth of this field? How have you seen it grow, change, and evolve in recent years? Sure, about breadth. As I mentioned before, just within the democracy R&D network, there are people working and doing amazing things in 32 countries on six continents. There is quite a lot of activity going on beyond those countries. Oh. In terms of evolution, I've been involved in this for maybe 10 years. Um, and I want to acknowledge someone in this audience who's been doing this for 50 years. That's Ned Crosby. He invented the citizen's jury 50 years ago. Without him, there would not be a democracy R&D or a healthy democracy or David Schechter doing this work. So thank you, Ned. Now, in terms of what I've seen just in the last 10 years, more deliberations, higher levels, tougher issues, better quality, making it permanent, more deliberations. Um, someone in the network, I, I'm not sure who it is, I'd have to, I'd have to check, uh, has a database with 2,000 in different countries, higher levels, um, earlier deliberations tended to be local. We've, we've got, still most are local, but we've had quite a few national ones. There's a conference on the future, citizen conference on the future of Europe going on at the level of the European Union. There have been global deliberations. Tougher issues, think abortion in Ireland, nuclear waste in Australia, um, political corruption in the state of Chihuahua in Mexico, reunification of the peninsula in Korea and climate change everywhere. Better quality, the state of the practice has gotten a lot better. The state of, the, of what people know how to do, how to select, how to facilitate, how to develop balanced information. Uh, we see the beginnings of standards. All those things are changing. And finally, making lottery deliberation a permanent part of democracy. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Felipe and Nicole, this next question goes to both of you. Uh, so Felipe, your organization has developed an extremely exciting example of lottery deliberation in Bogota. And Nicole, in many ways, Australia has been on the forefront of the international deliberative wave. What do each of you see as the core reasons people in your regions were drawn to this approach? What limitations challenge, or challenges exists um, in the existing system did it help solve? Felipe, did you want to go first? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> go, please. Okay, so um, the question is, what are the core reasons people might have done this? Um, um, <laughs> The underpinning a, a big one, which I'll tell you in a moment, is the fact that people are tired of hearing from the same voices. You ask elected officials this and they're tired of it being the same people turning up um, at all these different issues that they're raising and not solving big issues. So I think at the core of it, there's a feeling of we've got to be able to do this differently. What we've had that some places have had as well, but not many, is we had a legislative change. Um, and, you know, we've had legislative change here in Victoria, across the state of Victoria. Um, and so that came in last year. 
we've done in our careers, we've done about 39 deliberations. Of those, 14 have been in the last year. So you can see the power of legislative change shifts the, you know, people are kind of coming into it going, oh my gosh, we've got to do it. But they're learning a lot in the process. So yes, they don't really know what they're stepping into, but that certainly helped the shift happen. Why did that legislative change happen? Because there were people involved in uh, the whole review of an act saying there's got to be a way where we can uh, crack the old model of advisory committees or advisory panels that come in or with people who are known to the organisation, they stay there for years, they're not fresh, they're not coming in with new views on a topic, and they, they said, this is really important, we need to think about how we do this differently. So um, there's lots of core reasons, but um, and I think at the base it's really we want to change what we're doing, but certainly legislation kicked that along. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Felipe? Thanks. Thanks, Nicole, and, th and thanks, Casey. This is a gr great question. Very interesting. I would say, and, and, and first of all, congratulations for the presentation. It was wonderful. I, I learned a lot. Uh, incredible. And, and well, I would say I would say two things, or maybe three. The first one is I, I feel that politicians are also aware of the representative problems of electoral politics. They, they know they have this, this problem of, of representation. Um, our, our elected bodies are not descriptively representative in, they don't include gender, um, age, and other important descriptive uh, conditions. So this is one driver of, of lotteries, I think, uh, around the world. A second one, and also in Colombia, is the need to improve deliberation, to have other forms of public deliberation, not driven by polarization and, uh, and party politics and, you know, the way we are used to do things in, in politics, but to, to try to have different forms of, of, of deliberation and citizens can deliver that form of deliberation. I, I think that that's a very important attribute. And the third thing I would mention would be equality. I think that equality, the, the kind of equality that lotteries guarantee as a means to improve uh, representation and deliberation is very important in uh, unequal contexts and countries as, for example, Colombia. Colombia is one of the most unequal countries uh, uh, in the world. So the idea of lotteries is that everyone should have an equal opportunity to be part of, of the government. This is an important part of the, of, the, of the model. When we represent others, we, we learn empathy, we learn about the public interest as distinct from, from self-interest. Um, and, and we also learn a sense of, commu of commitment to the community of which we are uh, members. So, uh, lotteries allow to democratize this kind of knowledge, uh, allowing more people to learn these uh, capacities that come with the role of, of representation and, and deliberation. So I see lotteries, I see um, um, random selection, not just as a means of, is not just a, a democratic innovation, but also a, a solution to the problem of, of inequality, of political inequality. Excellent. Thank you so much for those answers. I'll pass it over to Alex. Fantastic. And um, just so the uh, audience knows, please feel free at any point to put questions in the chat and Lynn will be monitoring those and we'll circle back around at the very end of the event and try to get to at least a few audience questions. So just to let you know, that is an option. Um, so this next question for our panel of speakers is for everybody, so feel free to answer in whichever order. Um, we know that democratic lotteries, as we've all mentioned uh, now, fundamentally change who's involved in policymaking. Um, and we're wondering if each of you could describe the benefits and impacts of greater representation in your region or area of work. So kind of the, the benefits, the impacts, the, the, what that causes. Um, why is this important? How is it making a difference? Uh, 
I can I can I can say something connected to to the problem of of mm -hmm. equality and uh, this would be uh, Alex that for example I think that with the Bogota Citizens Assembly the the, the itinerant Citizens Assembly that we had in 2020 and 2021. Uh, something very important happened and it was that 50 percent of the assembly the half of the assembly was composed of low income citizens so of course low income citizens has had never reached before these levels of representation in in, in traditional elect, elected bodies uh, we had citizens from all over the city a, a city of eight million citizens uh, Paige was talking about Chapinero. Chapinero is a, a, a big neighborhood in, in, in Bogota. But we have other 18 like Chapinero, Bosa, Usme, uh, Ciudad Bolivar. We have citizens from all these, these different uh, localities. And we had actually more women than men. I, I don't know if of, of a, any elected body in Colombia, uh, not the Congress, not the city council, not any City, con city council in the country or, or, or assembly that has um, a, that is even close to parity, gender parity. But I, I think that the, that the, 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 the thing about a, a income equality is, is, a, is a one crucial change that the citizens assembly in, in our case brought. I think there are so many benefits. I know I'm, I know I'm really passionate about it, but this, I'll just name a few. I, I just think you see it all the time. We've recently done some research. Like every time we run a deliberation, we ask questions before and after to see how people are feeling about things. And, and it, it, it bar none, every one of these indicators goes up. So there's an increase in trust in processes, in organisations, in government, in elected officials. There's an increase in people's willingness to get involved in things beyond that event. So people getting involved in affairs that affect them in their society goes up. Um, we see greater community connection. It's really interesting hearing from participants saying things like, really feel like I'm part of this community. So it's it's having this social cohesion impact that we we kind of don't focus on so much, but it's but it's there. Another really important one I think is that uh, the community or those involved are increase in their level of respect and understanding of how difficult it is to make government decisions. And, you know, that understanding of like, whoa, this takes a bit of thinking and gosh, how do we weigh this up is huge. It's really, really beneficial for elected officials to see that people understand how hard that decision making for them is. And I think the other one is just an increased level of confidence, you know, sort of confidence that I can make a difference in this world because their input has been used directly to make a change that affects them. And, and I mean, there's probably heaps of other impacts, but I see that sense of, gosh, I've made a difference in the world, lift people at the end of a process. I, it, my friends and colleagues would say every time I finish a deliberation, I almost cry listening to the way people respond to the experience they've had. In fact, more often than not, I do cry. So, uh, yeah, it's the impact is um, quite tremendous and it's it's why I do what I do it's different to other forms of engagement because it has such high influence and people can make a difference I also think there's better results I actually think you get I can just keep going you get better results the quality of that um, the policy or the legislation or the uh, recommendation for a new pricing of water or something like that is better because the people who have the lived experience of working with that input into it, it is stronger, richer, and offer staff, like, you know, bureaucrats go, I have the conviction that what we're doing fits these people. So that, I mean, gosh, that's priceless. Casey, can I share my screen for a minute? Yes, I believe so. Let me let me just give you the It looks here. like, yeah, please do. Oh. Even drop drops. <laughs> let's, let's try this. Okay. 
while you're pulling that up, David, I just want to echo that uh, one of our former panelists who's here uh, just resonated with what you shared, Nicole, and said it's so true and everybody's sharing about how we cry after every process. <laughs> Go ahead, David. <laughs> well, I think about this in, in terms of uh, sort of four groups of things. First of all, those things that you were talking about, who's in the room, you get a group that's more representative than is delivered by elections or self-selections. You also get a group that's more diverse. And aside from representativeness, there are real benefits to diversity in decision-making. If you look at uh, Ellen Landemore's research at Yale, and you get a group of people who are more inclined to collaborate and don't come there to fight a battle and win against others. You also get a better process, a more informed process. People are making decisions based on real in-depth understanding of the question, a more thoughtful process. People are listening to others with an open mind, changing their ideas, trying to come up with something together. And very important, the process is much more resistant to manipulation. So if you get a better group of participants and a better group of process, as Nicole was saying, you get better results. You get better recommendations on really tough issues. There's better chances that those recommendations are actually feasible to implement. And you also get recommendations that can be more trusted by decision makers and by the public. What does that all result in? Well, for public decision makers, basically two things. It makes it possible to make hard decisions. Think same-sex marriage and abortion in Ireland, political corruption in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico, all reunification of the Korean Peninsula. So make hard decisions and build public trust. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, David. Thanks for that. All right. Well, we are remarkably still very close to being on time. We're very impressive panelists. Keep up the good work. Uh, that, brings us, that brings us to our third question, which is kind of a two-part question talking about making it permanent, which I've seen we've had some questions about as well in the chat. Um, so again, this is a question to all of you. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, and then uh, after you've answered, we'll come back to the second question. So each of you has recently been engaged in exciting permanent democratic reforms, taking what have historically been ad hoc or one-off projects and turning them into permanent parts of our democratic systems. We'd like to now ask each of you to share about creating, a, creating systemic changes in your unique contexts. Uh, so to start with, can each of you just tell us a little bit about the projects that you've been involved in recently? Sure, I'll start, Pacey. Um, so where we're working mostly over the last year has been in the local government sector of Victoria. So Victoria is a, one of the um, more populated states of Australia down in the southeast corner. And uh, we have a total of about 79 councils across Victoria. And they had to develop things like their council plan, which sets in place the next four years uh, direction for that council, as well as their what's called a community vision. So those two documents, alongside another two important pieces like the asset plan, et cetera, uh, have all been designated in the legislation to be run by deliberative engagement. So um, because that's it's not defined in the legislation what deliberative engagement is, it's a principles-based piece of legislation, which means those who really want to lean into it, lean into it well, and those who don't lean into it, don't lean into it well. Um, but we've worked with um, about, uh, I think, 12 of those 79 councils in the last year, and they have taken that on and started to, you know, really understand how lottery deliberation, how random selection and longer time communities writing their own report means to those sorts of documents who have been in place for decades. The other piece I'd say that we've been doing is working in the water sector. So every year our water authorities need to submit a price submission. So how what our prices will be for the next five years to our regulator. Uh, and I would say the water sector are about five years ahead of 
the local government sector here. Now, that I think that's super interesting because it's not legislated for the water sector, but they do have a policy that says you need to do better engagement. And what they do is they give them a rating. Are you standard? Are you advanced? Or are you leading? And it's a strange thing because all the water authorities now are buying for leading and it's meant that they've developed and improved their engagement from five years ago to today. And in both those sectors, they are now looking at really unusual ways of doing deliberation in order to get the best input from their community. So they're the kind of two big areas for us. Wonderful. Felipe or David? And I Again, our yeah. question here is just talking about your recent projects. Yeah, yeah, great, Katie. I, I would like to, to mention two, two projects in which we are working. One would, it's, it's in Colombia and the other one, it's, it's global. Um, so the first one in, in Colombia is uh, the, the itinerant citizens assembly I was, I was talking about uh, before. So in, in 2020, the, the Bogota a, a city council um, held organized the first citizens assembly in, in Colombia and I think one of the first um, experiences of, of its kind in Latin in Latin America so when we designed the process when we started designing the process we wanted two things we wanted to have more inclusion we wanted to have more citizens participating in the in the citizens assembly but we knew that if we increase the number of citizens we could lose deliberative capacities. It's, it's difficult to have uh, one single body with, I don't know, 1,000 people deliberating. That's very difficult. So we try to solve that puzzle by creating or through creating the, the itinerant citizens assembly uh, model. So the, the, so, so, and we didn't, we, we also didn't want, we, we also wanted a different, a, a different model. So, so, uh, the idea of an itinerant citizens assembly is that it is composed of different uh, assemblies or chapters as we call it uh, along the years so the itinerant citizens assembly was created in 2020 but the idea is that we are having assemblies in 20 21 22 and 23 for uh, assemblies and the assemblies are connected they uh, deliberate on a on a on a similar topic so, for example, one chapter can set the agenda, another chapter can discuss uh, the topic, a third chapter can do the uh, evaluation. And the model also uh, includes that some participants of the previous chapters uh, participate in the next chapter. So, for example, we have organized until now two chapters. The first one we had 110 citizens and the second one we had uh, 75. But in the second one, 30% of the participants came from the first chapter. So this is important because, of course, citizens who participate in this kind of assemblies or, or mini publics learn, and they can then teach something to other uh, citizens. So this is part of the, of the, of the idea of the, of, the, of the model. So this is the uh, itinerant citizens assembly that is, is organized by uh, many institutions and is is organized through a innovation lab located in the in the city council that it's called the the demo lab well and the other project i would like to mention because i think that it's also interesting in terms of of institutionalization and systemic change is the global citizens uh, assembly this was this year we had the first citizens global assembly it had 100 citizens from all over the world, uh, speaking 28 different languages and coming from 49 countries to deliberate for 68 hours of deliberation. And the assembly just delivered uh, its recommendations to the COP26. And IDEMOS uh, coordinated the group, the cluster for the uh, Spanish speaking countries. And we had participants from uh, Argentina, Cuba, Ecuador, uh, Republica Dominicana, Venezuela and, and, and Spain. And I mentioned this case in terms of institutionalization because I think that the idea is that this, the global citizens assembly will become part of the permanent uh, governance structure. 
And next year, we will have another global assembly on climate change. And uh, this might be also an, an experience of institutionalization at the, at the, at the global uh, level. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that, Felipe. Well, David, have we lost you? No. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. We, we've lost your video feed for the moment, oh. but we can hear you. Sorry. All right. I think I am back. Okay. Um, three things I've been involved in. In Scotland, I am working with a team headed by Doreen Grove, who is the head of open government for Scotland. The national government of Scotland has given her the assignment of developing a proposal for a way to make processes, deliberative processes, especially citizen assemblies, a permanent part of Scottish democracy. And that's it's probably going to have stages. It's probably going to start by putting in place the infrastructure and processes and capability to have one very good and influential on policy citizen assembly a year at the national level working with parliament but there it will also include expanding deliberative processes to as doreen says all parts of the system parliament government public authorities and local government so that's scotland in democracy r d i have been convening monthly meetings of people who are working on projects like this, such as Felipe and Nicole and Alex and Lynn and Doreen every month. And people are learning about each other's projects and uh, bringing, bringing problems that they're struggling with and getting help with them and so forth. The last thing I'm working on is uh, methodological guidance for people who are developing proposals like this when uh, we started convening things like citizen juries there was very little guidance about how to do that at this point there's been a ton of experience and there are some wonderful handbooks about that can go through each phase of the process when it comes to designing a chain a permanent change in democracy we don't have guidance like that yet so I've been talking to as many people as possible, like the other folks here who were involved in doing this and figuring out, so what questions do you need to address? In what order? What, what answers do you consider, et cetera? Okay, wonderful. Thank you all so much for those answers. Now, the second part of this question is also a bit, uh, a bit double-barreled, so hang with me here. Uh, first, what are the biggest challenges and how have you been addressing them? And complementing that question, what are the most exciting and inspiring new opportunities you see on the horizon with these kind of moves towards permanence? Any takers on who wants to start us off? David? Sure. Challenges. Um, probably the I guess the biggest one is uh, creating and maintaining sustainable political will to make the changes, uh, which means working with all political parties, including ones who are not in power. It means working with advocates, et cetera. Uh, a few years ago, Madrid enacted a wonderful reform to the way they do deliberative democracy that solves a problem with deliberative democracy anywhere which is that you have to have a lot of money to get enough signatures to get your initiative on the ballot they solved it in madrid about three months later they had elections a new party came into power and canceled not just that but participatory everything so people like doreen and her folks in scotland are trying to very carefully reach out to people across the political spectrum and advocates i'd say that was being the biggest one Another one is simply that design, designing uh, changes to democracy hardly exists as a field yet. It's new in the way that deliberation was new some years ago, certainly when Ned started out. Opportunities, Scotland, Bogota, the ongoing advisory panels in the city of Toronto and Canada, the conference in future Europe and just European Union in general, 
the work that Healthy Democracy is doing in Portland and Eugene, a project called Turn Up Democracy in Nigeria by an organization called Yaga Africa, and a move towards permanent citizen deliberation dealing with issues of corruption in Chihuahua, Mexico. Excellent, thanks. Felipe or Nicole? Yeah. Yeah, that, thank you, David. That was was great. Maybe I can I can address opportunities. I can I I, I am very optimistic about the this 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 trend. I think that the next in the next one or two decades, um, we will see in the world the first um, I don't know the word in English, but randomized official bodies and more permanent structures. I think that we will see that in the next uh, yeah ten years something like like that, um, but of course the model is still in in its infancy. If, if we think about, for example, um, representative institutions, I, I don't know. I sometimes tell my my students, imagine imagine uh, someone from the 18th century waking up in the 21st century in the year now, and um, maybe for that person. Um, would be extremely difficult to understand how we make friendships in social networks, how we travel, how we find uh, everything we do, WhatsApp, email, everything would be like science fiction, but not government. That person would understand government because it's very similar to the government they built two centuries ago. That person would perfectly understand the president, the Congress, the judges, would be very easy to understand. So that makes me think that institutions need a long-term process. So parliament, for example, to have the parliaments, the elected bodies that we have now, five centuries have passed. And so, so random institutions are actually very, very, very new in like the institutional uh, time uh, uh, scale. And, uh, but I will, I will mention, Casey, Two, uh, um, two instances or, or, or places where I think that random bodies have a great future. And one is uh, the, in the constitutional reform uh, process, both at the, for example, in the United States at the federal level, at the state uh, level. I think that in the future, constitutional conventions will incorporate uh, citizens assemblies to propose uh, reforms following the Irish, uh, the Ireland uh, case that uh, David uh, mentioned. So if we want to reform constitutions, I am sure that in the future, we will need to have a more qualified form of deliberation through citizens assemblies. And the other one, the other space where I think that this has a lot of future, but you guys are the pioneers in the world in this specific domain is in direct democracy. Um, uh, before voting on a recall or a referendum, we should have citizens' assemblies to inform other citizens before voting. For example, in Colombia, I think in my country, we had a plebiscite. Plebiscite is that the, the word? Yeah, plebiscite uh, two, two or three years ago about the, the, the peace agreement between the government and, and the guerrillas to try to solve a very long conflict, a 60 years conflict. Well, I think that it would would have been great in that process to have, for example, a citizens assembly deliberating before the plebiscite to inform the debate and to qualify the liberation. And of course, to qualify the crucial decisions that we the citizens had to make in that uh, opportunity. So I really wish that we would not have again a referendum or a plebiscite or a recall in Colombia we ha without having before uh, a lottery form of deliberation. I love it. Well done, Felipe. That's inspiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, I, I agree it, uh, exactly what David and, and Felipe have said. It, I see huge opportunities for um, what we call in the biz standing panels. 
um, be they at a local government level, a state level or a federal level. Um, now, you can go into lots of details around that. Obviously needs turnover and movement in it as well so people don't become, you know, kind of captured in that space. But huge opportunity there. I would love to see at each level of government a standing panel of citizens that are randomly selected. Um, I also think one of the biggest challenges, I know lots of people talked about opportunities, one of the biggest challenges is recruitment. I don't know if it's as much a challenge in other parts of the world, but uh, you can imagine we've had 79 councils, not all of them have gone random selection, but we've got all these places randomly selecting at once. We actually think recruitment could be done at a state level. There could be something done that really, you know, has a centralised approach to that recruitment to make it more cost effective, more efficient, and, you know, enables that to happen every year. So you're kind of turning over your standing panel and kind of streamlines it as a normal part of business. So uh, I believe that is both a challenge and an opportunity. I also think one of the biggest challenges, it's been mentioned before, but it's about um, willingness, conviction, confidence of elected officials to let go control. And I think one of the best ways to overcome that is really for them to experience it. So peer-to-peer, -peer, talking to other elected officials, sitting in and watching and seeing the impact. And that's the sort of thing we've been trying to do is bring those leaders together to enable them to feel more confident that it's something they can let go of. So that whole you know, elected officials, haven't I got a mandate, you know, letting that go and empowering their, their um, community to have a go is a big challenge. But so worth doing. And I also think just generally understanding what this thing is, is the challenge. You know, we use lots of terms. I love the word on the words that you did, Alex. Um, I, I think that sometimes that gets a bit complicated and, and people don't really understand ra random stratified sampling or lotteries and, you know, all those sorts of things. So, so I think that there's just learning in the space that needs to happen. And that comes from experience and lived experience. Um, one of the big things I see is kind of as an opportunity going forward is um, playing with the model. Um, and I know I've shown both Felipe and Lynn and David my thoughts on models and how it works. Um, things like doing little panels that feed into bigger panels, which is like what Felipe's done, or a systemic series of panels that deals with the system as a whole or side-by-side -side panels uh, of different sorts of uh, groupings of people working on the same issue. You know, these are the sorts of opportunities I think we've got to really start to explore in this deliberative space. There's so much material out there for us to keep understanding how we can use this. Well, excellent. Thank you all so much for sharing that. And Again, an applause to you for being so timely. I've never met such a timely uh, panel. With that being said, we're going to turn it over to Lynn to uh, field some of our uh, audience questions. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that was super interesting and educational. I uh, really appreciate you all being here. I'm going to try to put some questions together. Feel free to keep dropping things in chat. Uh, I'm not sure we'll get through everything, but we'll try to. I'll try to sort of move this, move this through as many of these questions as possible. So let's start at uh, a, a fairly high, high level. Um, what are? This is a question from an anonymous uh, questioner here. What are the different ways democratic lotteries have been established by executive leadership, legislation, popular referendum? Under what circumstances? Uh, as well, crisis situations or more gradual evolutions. We talked, we covered some of this stuff, but uh, uh, yeah, this person wants to know a little bit more about how how they get off the ground. What can you share about what you've seen in terms of the politics of getting democratic lotteries? I'm a I'm a big fan of Ian Walker's approach of talking to lots and lots of politicians and public decision makers and asking what's hard. After a while, you find issues where these folks would be really happy to convene a sample of the public to make a recommendation and follow it because it would get, get them out of an untenable situation, a decision they can't make. Hmm. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you, David. It's kind of like put your, put your hard problems up um, and where you felt like it's hard to, there's no call, it's grey, it's not black and white. Put those things out there where you're not sure what the answer is. If you're if you're determined and you know what it is, then that's not your topic. But certainly I think getting it off the ground through even a small example of that, a small issue first, experience it, have a go, get out there and see how it works can then help it grow because that's what we've seen in Australia. I recall one CEO of a, a council up in Queensland saying it wasn't until I saw it and experienced it that I could then go and spread it everywhere I went. That's what I'm going to do. So I think that the, giving people small opportunities to have a go is a way to kind of build this up. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree completely, Nicole and, and David. And, you know, I think that another important thing is to choose topics that actually matter to the, peop to the people, um, things that are on, in the political agenda and that the people want to discuss about. And I think that another criteria for choosing the topic is choose a topic where um, new solutions are badly needed. Because I, I agree completely with Nicole that one of the virtues of, of lotteries is not just democratic inclusion, descriptive representation, better deliberation, uh, equality, but it has also an instrumental value. It improves policy. <laughs> Actually, people, citizens can do better policy than policymakers, traditional policymakers. So we have to, where in problems, issues, where we haven't uh, come up with good solutions, with creative solutions, I think those topics are great candidates for, uh, for, for many publics and citizens' assemblies. I would also add, and David's excellent for this, <laughs> that evidence, you know, evidence that it works or connecting to leaders, even in other jurisdictions, other places of the world, et cetera, helps give other leaders who have control over making this decision, whether we should do it or not, confidence that it can be done. So, David, you must have thoughts about that as well. Just absolutely. I would I just like to underscore that. And I'm thinking of an example from the New Democracy Foundation in Australia, who did some great work with the city of Melbourne years ago, and then they had a change of administration, weren't interested in doing anything else but they had big issues around city planning. At some point, if, um, I, I connected them of the new democracy people with Mass LBP in Toronto, who have their Toronto planning review panel. And about three introductory emails later, the people in Melbourne were saying, oh my God, so that's what you're doing. This is great. Went from closed door to open door in, in three emails within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, let me just jump in with another sort of a couple of questions together here on the topic of, I think, diversity. Um, so I'm gonna put these two together from Jessica and Renee. How do you accommodate the important and increasingly recognized element of intersectionality in your demographic diversity selection? rather than risking a reduction of diversity to single characteristics. And the other question on this topic, when selecting and implementing these groups, how do you approach and compensate for cultural diversities, gender roles, caste or class considerations, et cetera? Some questions about uh, diversity in the selection and in the process. Do you want to go for Lee Payne? I'm sure there's yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 I was thank you for, for the question. This is a very, very important question and it always has been when we before, for example, when we've discussed about another topic, for example, quotas, electoral quotas. This 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 issue is is, is always very, very, very important. But one one way to solve it or to, to address it is at least in the in the in the Bogota case is that of course, when we have bigger numbers, when we include more people, for example, more women, we can include more perspectives among uh, uh, women. Um, and for the itinerant citizens' assembly model, I think that one of its virtues is that it allows some kind of descriptive variety along the different chapters. 
So one of the things that we want to do, we haven't done it completely yet. We have to, we want to have some forms of enclave deliberation in future chapters. For example, chapters with uh, only women, for example, to, to, to try to address how previous recommendations behave or yeah, under, under a gender perspective. So for including intersectionality and to broaden uh, the, the descriptive um, qualities of, of, of lotteries, I think that it's very important to think on models that help us to include more citizens, more people. And I think that maybe this uh, itinerant model can, can help a little bit to, to do uh, uh, this. It's a tough question, of course. <laughs> I think um, I think it's a really good question because obviously the more filters we put into a random selection process, the harder it is to fill to fill the room because we're kind of you know dropping people out if they fill a fill a filter. And intersectionality is really interesting. We're running a process now which has got mini panel processes that is specifically focused on vulnerable voices that feed into a bigger panel process. And one, the, the different, a couple of the different cohorts are a, a young person's group, so 16 to 25, a, a, a culturally and linguistically diverse group and, um, and blind and low vision group. There was a 24-year-old 24, 24 Indian blind woman who was involved in the process. And you go, well, which, which you know, she fits into all those groups. Um, and when you do reduce it down to one filter, it gets, it starts to become a little bit kind of mixed. So it's, I think it's all about being aware of that in my mind and going, what is our purpose here? What are we attempting to do? And just being really mindful of the fact that every single person that comes into these processes is intersectional. <laughs> every single person fits different profiles and filters. And, and so what we, what we rely on is randomization to help us deal with that. I remember way back the very first deliberation we ran for the City of Melbourne, which was the 10-year financial plan, we didn't have a cultural background as one of the filters. And the, the organisation was really worried. You know, we have a very diverse multicultural community in Melbourne. Um, and Carson, who's one of the titans in the field of this, said randomisation helps us with that. And that's exactly what happened. Because we randomised, we had a very multicultural set of people in the room. So we don't have to rely solely on the filters we put in place. We have to rely on randomization to help us fill those spaces. Then in the room itself, there's a whole nother piece, isn't it, around thinking about not just those filters, but about power and power imbalances and how they play out across gender, across culture, across age, because that's, and that is the power of a highly skilled facilitator to overcome those situations, to bring them to the fore, to make clear and apparent what are the biases that we have in the room and to help us overcome them. So they would be my two big, you know, how do we overcome these sort of solutions? One twenty nine. <laughs> All right, sure. Let's let's move on then. Not saying uh, that's that's great. Actually, let's see if we can slip in one more question here before the end of of our time. Uh, I think. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go with with this one. I'm going to broaden it a little bit beyond what the question is. So the question talked about um, sort of uh, a need to think about our how this impacts or just the future of, of democratic values in our society and talking about the United States and our core democratic systems feeling like they're slipping away at times. Uh, and, and then a question specifically about wondering if there's an opportunity for a mashup between participatory budgeting and uh, democratic lotteries, which might be a nice way to end here. Uh, to talk, if you can talk about sort of how this addresses uh, the, that sort of general, um, uh, uh, what disengagement with democracy or our fears about democracy and how this might work together with other kinds of reforms to do that.
David, would you like to start? <laughs> well, just about the just about the piece uh, about participatory budgeting. The city of Paris now has a standing panel of 100 randomly selected citizens. They will have the power to create bills that have to be considered by the city council. Um, they can convene citizens' juries, one citizens' jury a year, a lot like Ostbelgen, and they set, they choose the theme for Paris's participatory budgeting each year. That's one piece. Um, in several, in a number of places in Australia, and I think Nicole was in, involved in Melbourne, yeah. there have been randomly selected bodies who developed proposals that were pretty much accepted, not just for a small discretionary piece of a budget, but for the entire city budget revenue and expenses. Um, in Melbourne, in Jeanette Hart's CARP standard in Greater Geraldton, New Democracy did it early on in a, a small suburb called Canada Bay. And something similar happened in some pretty poor areas, peripheral regions in the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil, done by Deliver, Deliver Brasil. So there is a lot of potential for citizen deliberation to be used for budgeting, including in situations of great inequality and i would concur like the short answer is yes <laughs> mash them <laughs> why not i would i would say on on democracy on um, uh, leaving your question on the core values of, of 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 democracy you know i think that we have the politics we have because we have the political institutions that we have this is not natural. I think that the things that are happening around the world are the consequence of specific political institutions we have. If we, if we have a just adversarial institutions, institutions that are based on anger and on, on, on partidism and on, on political differences, we will replicate that kind of, of model. And so, so I, I think that if we think of different types of institutions, of political institutions, we will change how citizens, um, how, how everything works. And one of the wonderful things about lotteries, I think, is that it's not, it's not the kind of adversarial institution that we are used to in electoral politics. It's not that kind of institution. It's an institution built more on friendship on solidarity, on empathy, and on other political values that were important in other moments of history. For example, for the Greeks, where actually this model was created uh, thousands of year, years uh, 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 ago. So yeah, I, I think that every generation, uh, Lean has to try to reinvent democracy. Democracy is equality, it's nothing more, it's equality. So we have to give a new meaning to that word. And I, I, I believe that, that this is a, a path, an interesting path for, for, this, for this century and for this generation. Well, that sounds like a pretty appropriate place to, to end this, I think, if, if you all agree. Um, I just wanna say thank you very much to both my colleagues, Casey and Alex, and to all three of our guests, Nicole and Felipe and David, at various times of the day and night. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, to all of you for sticking around. Um, somebody mentioned, asked if there would be a recording of this webinar, and yes, there will be. We'll definitely put it up on our face or on our uh, on our YouTube page, and then probably share it out through social media and to everybody who RSVP'd. So thanks so much, everyone. A couple of questions that we didn't get to. Please do feel free to email us, and we'll try to take down who you are uh, to get back in touch. So um, thanks so much, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you for doing this. It was Thank lovely. So well done. Thank you. Discussion. Bye. Un abrazo. Ciao. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs>